and we are back for the Thousand Worlds Book Club, and we're talking about Night Flyers. Night Flyers is... Oh my god, it was such an awesome movie. Oh crap. Hello, Chad. All hail the Queen in the North. So we're here to talk about Night Flyers, right? That incredible movie? I would say it's somewhat better than season five, but not quite as good as season six. No, actually, we're here to talk about George R. Martin's written story of Night Flyers. Reading? Reading is for nerds. Why read the book when the live action is just as good, if not better? Well, if you're not too much into reading, there's also an audio version available. The link for that is below, though I will say the reader is rather slow, and you can probably listen to it on double speed. Now, it should be noted that there are two versions of Night Flyers. There's the original version and the longer novella version. In the original version, most of the characters don't have names. The revision names everyone and expands on the human interaction and their thoughts a bit. Though at the end of the day, there aren't too many substantive changes. It's just a longer, more detailed route to the same place. Both versions are linked below. And let's not forget about the link to the movie below. Ah, uh, the movie. So Chad, what exactly did you like about the movie? What didn't I like? I mean, it stars the girlfriend from The Last Starfighter, and Uncle Phil, and Murdoch from MacGyver, and John Aaron? Wait, really? John Aaron? Yeah, the main academic guy is the same guy who played John Aaron in his incredible two-second portrayal of dead John Aaron. Well, the character is named Caroli DeBrannon in the story. I think in the movie they make him Michael DeBrannon. So, John Aaron then. Anyway, who's the last Starfighter's girlfriend? In the movie, she's Miranda Dorlack, but in the written story, she's Melantha Jurl. Menthol girl? No, Melantha Jurl. Mylanta? Sure, why not? Who's the hologram guy? That's Royd Eris. Hemroid? Those are the three most important characters and the ones that are named in the original Night Flyer story. Caroli de Brannon is the academic who discovers the legend of the Vulcran and discovers where one might be. Melantha Jurl is a genetically engineered Promethean who is an expert on alien cultures. Royd Eris is the ship's captain and is the all-powerful shut-in. The all-powerful shut-in is a reoccurring character type from oh so many George R. R. Martin stories. Royd sees all and hears all, and is even super pale with blonde hair, just like Bloodraven. A shut-in? Is that why he's called Hemroid? Because he's been sitting on his butt too long? Why is George R. R. Martin so obsessed with white-haired people anyway? Well, I think it's taken somewhat from Tolkienian elves, but George R. R. Martin's albino and albino-esque fetish is huge. An albino or an albino-like character is featured in a dozen stories. Without a doubt, George R. R. Martin is giving homage to Elric, the main character of Michael Moorcock's fantasy stories. Moorcock is an enormous influence on Martin, with the foundations of Valyrian culture, the rivalry between Bloodraven and Bittersteel, and the eternal battle of R'hllor against the Great Other, being largely taken from Moorcock's writings. <laughs> George R. R. Martin likes Moorcock. Anyway, enough talk about these stupid books. Tell me about Uncle Phil. Well, neither Uncle Phil nor his fresh octopus appear in the written story. Anyway, on a basic level, Night Flyers is simply a ten little Indian horror story where the characters die off until only Last Girl remains. But on another level, it's weird. Mega weird. Cross-gender mother clone being downloaded into a computer and still retaining her telekinesis weird. Genetically engineered racist gymnast slash alien anthropologist protagonist who fucks everyone on the ship weird. Telekinesis being used to create a vacuum around someone's head in order to cause it to explode weird. I've said it before and I'll say it again. There is no fan theory about A Song of Ice and Fire that is weirder than Night Flyers. The potential for George R. R. Martin to be bonkers off the wall weird is unlimited. You haven't talked at all about Murdoch. Are you trying to say he's not in the written story? No, he is. In the written story, he's called Thale Lassimer, and he's actually a lot like Sweet Robin. He's a paranoid youth who has watery eyes and wants to sleep all the time. And the other characters like to use psychotropic drugs on him. Thale Lassimer is a very powerful telepath, and I do suspect that Sweet Robin is the same. 
Two very important drugs are given to Thalassimer in the story. There's Cyanine-4, which reduces his telepathic abilities and makes him tired. And there's Esperon, which enhances his telepathic abilities. Keep in mind, in A Song of Ice and Fire, Bran is given two very similar drugs to this. Sweet Sleep, which reduces his telepathic abilities and causes him to fall asleep, and Acorn Paste, which seems to enhance his abilities. Sweet Robin as well seems to be drugged up on Sweet Sleep. So besides the powerful telepath Thale Lassimer, the other characters on the ship are Agatha Marriage Black, who is a less powerful handler of Thale Lassimer, Alice Northwind and Lamy Thorne, who are experts on computers. Both Lamy Greenhands and Alistair Thorne may be named after her. We also have the bickering linguists Daniel and Lindren, and the alien biologist Rogen Christophorus. Rogen Christophorus is probably named after Chris Christopherson, one of George R. Martin's favorite musicians. Oh my god, Chris Christopherson was so awesome in Blade. He was a musician before that? Anyway, Night Flyers begins with an explanation of what the Vulcran is. The Vulcran is a mysterious body that is heading out of the galactic core at a slow sublight speed. Wherever it went near, psi-gifted individuals went nuts. There's even an implication that all of the visions and miracles around the time of Jesus, supposedly, were enabled by the Vulcran passing by. Of course, this is once again a case of a celestial body being something more. We had the ship shooting star in Men of Greywater Station, and we had the ship plague star in Tough Voyaging. And here we have the legendary Vulcran. It all makes me wonder about the nature of the comet from A Clash of Kings, and whether it's related to people's abilities on Planetos. Perhaps it's enhancing magic, perhaps it's enhancing people's psi abilities, just like the Vulcran is. So Caroli de Brannon thinks the Vulcran are an ancient race, so he hires Royd to take his team to go find the Vulcran. However, the big conflict is that Royd won't leave his inaccessible control room and instead speaks to everyone via hologram. Over the course of weeks, people start getting really curious and paranoid about Royd. The telepath Thale Lassimer senses danger, so at first his handler dampens him with cyanine, however, everyone thinks the danger may be Royd. So later the handler enhances Thale's abilities with Esperon. Once Thale is given Esperon, his head explodes, and Thale's handler falls into a coma. This naturally leads to more paranoia about Royd, so the two computer techs decide to break into Royd's computer system. They succeed, but then the airlock opens and they get sucked out. The ship gets damaged in the airlock incident, so the ship stops and everyone goes outside to do repairs, including the comatose handler Agatha and even Royd Eris. Seeing an opportunity, Christophorus sneaks back in and tries to cut a hole into Royd's command room. In a very chilling scene that George R. Martin likely hoped would be in a horror movie, a floating eyeball gazes at Christophorus as he slips and then is killed by a cutting laser. Oh, that's kind of like this scene from the movie. Outside, over the comm, everyone hears Christophorus' voice, and the two linguists are drawn inside. Christophorus is now a space zombie, and he kills one of the linguists, who then reanimates and kills the other. Meanwhile, outside, Royd reveals that everyone is getting killed by his cross-gender clone mother, who is living a second life inside the ship's computer. And so Melantha and Royd go back inside to fight zombies and try to regain control of the ship. Meanwhile, Caroli de Brannon leaves everyone on his space sled, to die in pursuit of the Vulcran. He, by the way, takes with him Agatha Marie Black, giving her a death sentence as well. He is basically a real asshole. I suppose he's supposed to be somewhat like Gollum, calling the Vulcran, my Vulcran. They find the Vulcran, and Agatha reveals that the Vulcran is simply a big animal that travels space using telekinesis. The two die either in a collision with the Vulcran, or the Vulcran eats them. Meanwhile, on the ship, Royd and Melantha do battle with Ghost Mom, who is using the ship's gravity to kill them. Royd dies, but realizes that he too is a telekineticist, and downloads himself into the ship and stops his mother. The story ends with Melantha and Second Life Royd following the Vulcran for the rest of Melantha's life. Royd and his mom still somewhat battling for control of the Night Flyer inside the computer. So Chad, wouldn't you say there are a lot of elements from Ice and Fire here in Night Flyers? Dude, I told you, I only watched the movie. But in the movie, Murdoch's body gets seized like Hodor's does. <laughs> so 
So yeah, there's no body seizing in Night Flyers. However, they do talk about it, and they mention that even the most powerful telepaths can't take over another person's body. If these rules apply to Ice and Fire, Bran is pretty special. He's the most powerful telepath in the world in that he can seize Hodor. The second most powerful telepath that we run into, Vermeer Sixskins, fails to take over another person's body. Interestingly, in Night Flyers, the dead can be animated through telekinesis. I'm not sure how exactly this is done, whether it be limbs being lifted with telekinesis or nerves and neurons being fired with it. Royd's mother thinks it's a pretty good strategy to use them. I do wonder if the others are a master of this technique and that it's all just telekinesis. Well, that computer that Royd's mother lives in is kind of like the Werewood Net. It's almost identically so. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the children of the forest talk about the Werewood Net remembering people. The computer crystal has downloaded the memories of a human being, and therefore its ghost. We also hear about partial memories and partial ghosts. This is mentioned with Marantha Jurel's Whisper Jewel. And we hear about a memory of Old Nan being a piece of Old Nan. And Kyburn talks about ghosts when a remnant of a person is left behind when they leave a room. By the way, these Whisper Jewels will return in Dying of the Light and crystalline souls will return in the glass flower. The point being, George R. R. Martin is obsessed with blended consciousness and partial consciousness, whether it be the blended consciousness of the Werewood Net or the partial consciousness of, say, Aurel in his eagle. Well, you already mentioned that Hemroid is like Blood Raven. He is, but there's an interesting twist to this all-powerful shut-in. Royd eventually reveals that he's not the one that's actually in control. His mother is. He's not the puppet master, he's the prisoner. I do wonder about the nature of Bloodraven. Is he actually in control, or are the children of the forest or the Werewood Net controlling him? The story mentions that being psi talented is also genetic, and of course in A Song of Ice and Fire it seems to be genetic as well. Interestingly, they do mention that psi talents can be trained in certain ways, whether it be telepathy or empathy or telekinesis. This may explain why Bran's abilities are somewhat different from Jon's abilities, or Arya's abilities, or Sansa's potential abilities. Now this story actually specifically says that telepathic abilities are not sex-linked. If the rules of Night Flyers are the same as the rules of Ice and Fire, this would go against my Genetics of Dragons and War videos. Not that dragon riding wouldn't be the result of Mendelian genetics, but we wouldn't be able to track it so easily. Of course, Royd and his mother being albinos and also being super genetically special is much like Bloodraven who's an albino and also super genetically special. Another weird similarity between Night Flyers and A Song of Ice and Fire is the arbitrary rule of gravity and psi ability. For reasons, George R. R. Martin has made gravity the enemy of telekinesis. And in A Song of Ice and Fire, Bran's telepathic abilities seem to be awoken by his fall. It's a moment of weightlessness, and I can only assume that Bran used telekinesis to soften his fall. I will say this story Night Flyers, despite being on a ship in the middle of nowhere, has a lot to do with the rest of the Thousand Worlds. I thought you said you didn't read the story. Shut up, dude. What I'm saying, there's so many references to other things that appear in other stories. We hear about Findy and Harangans, as well as a bunch of those inner core aliens that are talked about in the Stone City. The story starts on Avalon, involves a Promethean, and ends in the Veil. Vale. All the characters are from the Academy of Knowledge that Clarinamas started. There's the relationship of Prometheus and genetic engineering. And there's even that Whisper Jewel from Dying of the Light. George R. Martin loves his continuity, and his albinos, and more cock. All right, Chad, that's enough out of you. That's about all the time we have for Night Flyers. Next time we'll be talking about a real gem of a story, this Tower of Ashes. In my opinion, this is one of George R. R. Martin's best. The link to the written story and the audio are below. See you next time.